He said that. He said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a guide to my path. And so, and so the word of God is the only guidance through life. You know, I've recently been watching a few clips by a, a fairly famous celebrity that's recently, I believe, become a born again Christian. And, and you know, he's he's kind of just the simplicity of turning to his word. He said, you know, to think that there's a, a guidebook for life that he never knew about. And it's the Bible. The Bible is God's guidebook for life. And so the Bible is there to give us direction and to lead us when we don't know the way forward. And the Bible is there this afternoon to give us the words of comfort. When, when, when things are hard and when things are tough. And we can think of various passages in the Bible that we can draw comfort from. And perhaps one of the most well-known uh, chapters in the Bible that gives us comfort is the words of Psalm 23, that the psalmist through it, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And we read these verses, don't we, and we draw comfort from it. And it gives us a sense of the fact that even in our trials and in our difficulties, God is there, God is with us, God is beside us. And we can draw strength from that. And maybe also now, you know, maybe that's what you think the Bible is. It's just a book where you turn to in, in life's extremities and you ask God to show you a way out. Or you turn to God in a, in a time of, of sadness and grief and, and sorrow and, and you expect him just to give you a word of comfort. And maybe you've been guilty of just using the word of God for one of those purposes and it's there. And it is, it's an amazing book we can do that with. But the Bible also tells us some hard things. Some hard things to... To, to hold on to some hard things to, to grasp. It tells us things about, about life and it tells us things about death and it tells us things about beyond death. And that's what I want to think about this afternoon. I want to think about beyond death. See, we think so often, don't we? Our, our lives revolve around the here and now, don't we? And we are so focused on, on time. But the reality is this, that that time is a very short thing. Our lives are very short. You know, the Bible says that if we get 70 years, that's the kind of average lifespan, 70 years. And we all know, don't we, that there are people who get that. And there are people who get beyond that. But we also know, don't we, that there are people who get over near that. There are people who, who, who only get a few years. Sadly, isn't it the case that there are little infants sometimes and they only get a few months or a few weeks, a few days, sometimes even just a few hours. Life is so short, life is so brief. And we focus so much on that, don't we? And we focus so much on, on, on making those that period of time so good, so productive. Try to make the best of that. And we invest ourselves into time. We invest ourselves into making sure that we've got a good life and a comfortable life. And we invest our time into making sure that we've got a good job and we can buy the things that we want to make our life more comfortable. And we invest our time into our, uh, our relationships. And you know, we should invest time into our relationships. Into the relationships we have with our families and our friends, our spouses, and these sort of things. But even those relationships are, are brief, aren't they? When we think of eternity, when we think of an endless period of time that you and I are going to exist for, and we focus on a few brief hours, a few brief years here on earth, and we take so little thought of what happens after that. We take so little thought for the eternity that lies beyond. For a few moments this afternoon, I want you to think of what lies beyond. I want you to think of two men. We read about them in Luke chapter 16. And we'll start reading in verse 19. As I say, these are not nice words to read, really. But I trust this afternoon, but as I speak about them, that I Speak about them more because I want you to think about eternity and stuff. I want you to think about the reality that beyond death, there's eternity. And death doesn't end everything. Sadly, you know, we live in a society, don't we, and 
And that is so often the teaching that we get that you know death is the end of it. <clears throat> Their bodies disintegrate, and that's it. And we've been here and we've enjoyed 70 years, 50 years, 40 years, 100 years something. And that's it. There's no, there's some beyond it. It's eternity. And I want you to think for a few moments this afternoon about eternity. And I want you to think that if that is somewhere where you're going to be forever, then surely it's something that is worth your consideration this afternoon. Two men, and it says there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. And he feared sumptuous, this is verse 19 of chapter 16 in Luke. And he feared sumptuous every day, and there was a certain beggar, and he was named Lazarus. He was full of sores, he was laid at his gate. He desired to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and they licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died, and he was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and kill my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things. And likewise, Lazarus, evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I've got five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. And Abraham said to him, They've got Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, They do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. We know that God blesses his word. You know, difficult words to read. <coughs> Saul words perhaps to listen to. But we believe this afternoon that scripture is God breathed, it's inspired by God. And God has got a message for us in these verses we've read together. <coughs> a, a message that will perhaps challenge us to think I trust about eternity. Because we read about two men. Two men who really, as far as life was concerned, couldn't have been more different. We read about a rich man. A rich man who wore luxurious clothing. A rich man who ate sumptuously every day. A rich man who had everything that this world could grow. And in contrast to that, we read about another man who's named for us, and his name is Lazarus, and it said that he was a beggar. And as far as this world was concerned, he had nothing. He had no, uh, nothing that he could call his own. He had an emaciated body. He had a hungry stock. And his longing was that if he would lie at the gate of the rich man, that, that the rich man would take pity on him and give him some of his food uh, to, to feed him. And they had nothing. He wanted everything. He wanted nothing. And it said these solemn words, Lazarus died. And it says this, the rich man died also. See, there's no escape in it, is there? You know, death is the one thing in life that we can be absolutely sure about. And it doesn't matter this afternoon whether you, you can identify yourself with a rich man who's got everything who's achieved all that this world could offer, and more, who's got the ability to dress in the best of gear every day, who's got the ability to sit at a table laden with food every day and engorge himself on it. Or whether you maybe identify yourself with a beggar, and maybe as far as this world's concerned, you don't have very much, you don't possess very much. You know what it's saying, end of life, it doesn't matter. Genuinely, it doesn't matter. Because the rich man died. 
and see everything he'd worked for and everything he'd enjoyed and all the pleasures that life could give him came an abrupt end the moment he died. And I want to say this afternoon kindly, if all you're interested in is just accumulating as much as you can for the few brief years of life that you've got here in this earth, then the sad reality is this, that when you die, all just comes to pain. You know, one of the wisest men that ever lived, Solomon, you know, he said, vanity, vanity, fall is bad. He was a man with that. One of the best kings that ever reigned over Israel. One of the richest. He brought people from far off countries to, to show them the wealth they had. To show them all that he'd accomplished, all that he'd accumulated. And he said, see the end of all, which is vanity of vanities. It's all vanity. He says, I'll leave it. Can you take it with me? He says, I'll leave it to my children and then who knows what they'll do with it. They may just squander it and waste it. He said, it's all just vanity. You know, this afternoon, if all we're building for in life is for time, then it's all just vanity. It's vanity. In a nice house, if you've got one, and I'm not despising these things, by the way. I'm just saying that these are the things that are your priority. And your healthy bank balance, and your flashy car, and your good boots, and your exotic qualities. And all these sort of things that you invest your time into, you die, you don't take any of it. Think about eternity this Prioritize eternity. Because that's what different between these two men. You know, as you read through that story, maybe you read it or as you listen to me, you maybe you thought, well, you know, that man was. He was cast out of God's presence forever because he was rich. He was cast out of God's heaven forever because, because of the life that he lived and because of his wealth and his exuberance and all of that. And remember you thought to yourself, well, that, that beggar, he was accepted into God's heaven. He, he was accepted into God's presence because he had a life of poverty here on earth. And maybe as you read through that, maybe that was the conclusion you came to. But you know, the Bible tells us, the Bible says, look, the, the salvation the experience is not a salvation that we get based on based on what we have or don't have. It's not a salvation that we get based on, on what we've done or what we haven't done. Paul, when he writes to the Christians in Ephesus, he says, it is concerning our salvation that is an offer, the hope of heaven. It's by grace. He says, it's by grace you are saved through faith, that not of yourself, but it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so the rich man was in hell because he was rich. The rich man was in hell because he never gave any thought to God. He never gave any thought to his eternal soul. He lived for the here and now. His priority was all about time. And he never gave a thought to God. And he never gave a thought to his need for salvation. And that's why he's in hell. And the poor man, the poor man is not in heaven because he, because he was poor and God felt pity for him and God felt sorry for him. The poor man is in heaven because there was a time when he accepted his need of a saviour. He accepted that he was lost in his sin. He accepted that he was separated from God. And he desired a relationship with God. And so there was a time in his life when he trusted the Lord Jesus and he accepted Christ as his Savior and he came in and he agreed to that salvation. And that is why one is in heaven and one is in hell. Because one placed priority on his soul and one placed priority on his life. Where's your priority this afternoon? Is your priority just for the time? Or have you made preparation for the future? Have you made preparation for eternity? You know, it's always good, isn't it, to be forward thinking? It's always good to be planning. But I know there are things that can disrupt our plans, but generally it's a good idea to plan 
It's not always a great idea to fly with the sea of fans, is it? And I know a lot of us are guilty of that. Of just kind of going with the flow and taking things as they come, but but you know, generally it's a good road to plan, isn't it? You kind of plan out your week, you plan out your month, maybe even plan out your year. Make sure you get your annual leave requests in when you want them. Make sure it coincides with the rest of the family's annual leave so we're all going to holiday together. You know, sit down, Ruth sits down at the beginning of a week and she puts out a, food, a, a meal plan so that she knows how she, what she's going to cook for the rest of the week. You know, the young couple in our house and they're planning a wedding. And that's not just going to happen, is it? You know, maybe they hope they can maybe just fly when they see their fans turn up on the day and everyone's just going to be there. It's no, they've got to be planning, they've got to be preparation, isn't it? Generally, a good idea to plan and prepare. So if there's a good idea this afternoon to plan and prepare for time and for these sort of menial things that we've been thinking about, like what we're going to eat and when we're going to go on holiday, and even something as big as a wedding. You know, if you're going to take time to plan for that, then I think it only makes sense that we plan for eternity. That we plan for the reality that when we close our eyes today, <clears throat> we'll find ourselves in one of two places. We'll find ourselves either in hell because we've rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, because we've not accepted that we need him, because we've not accepted that we were sinners who are going to be judged for our sin and accept that when he came, he came to be a saviour for our sin. He came to take our place and die in our stead. We've never accepted him as our saviour. So we go to hell, separated from God forever and forever. Hell is an awful place. Make no mistake about it. I know, I know there's this kind of idea that we can kind of character, uh, characterize it and all that and, and caricatures of, of the devil and of hell and, and people have this kind of misconception that hell is going to be something wonderful. The hell is going to be something enjoyable. The hell is going to be one eternal party. What does the scripture say? Concerning hell, when this man, rich man, found himself there, he says, I just want a drop of water from my tongue. He says, Because I am tormented. Tormented. People talk, don't they, about life in hell. And I know. I know people have got life hard. And I'm going to walk here this afternoon to catch stones or point fingers <laughs> because I know that there are people, who maybe even people in this room, and their life has just been one hardship after another. And maybe at the end of the day, maybe you look back over your life and you think, my life is hell. I want to say to you, no matter how bad your life is, your life is not hell. Hell is a place of torment. Exists forever, forever, forever. And it's a real place. And it's not something to be joked about, and it's not something to be laughed about, and it's not something to be treated lightly. It's a place that is reserved for people who refuse the great offer of salvation that God has provided His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this man is there. He's there when Luke wrote those words. I am tormented in this flame. And this is not a parable. This is a real story. These are real individuals. And when Luke wrote those words thousands of years ago, they penned those words, I am tormented. And as he thought about the prospect of some of his family joining them there, he said, warn them because I don't want them to come to this place of torment. See, there are people in hell today. People in hell today that are crying out that you wouldn't go there. They're not waiting there with open arms to accept you. They're not waiting there to get the party started. They're crying out in anguish that you wouldn't go there. A place of torment. I mean, look at those words thousands of years ago. That man was there. Two thousand years ago, and that man's still there. Languishing, and torment. In two thousand years from now, in two thousand years beyond that, and just keep going for eternity. There's a man that's languishing in eternity, torment. 
because he failed to acknowledge that he needed a saviour. He failed to acknowledge that he was a sinner. He only made preparation for time. He never took any thought for his soul. And his soul is lost. And it's lost forever. That's recorded, isn't it? It says that between you and us, as this conversation is going on, it says between you and us, there is a great gulf fixed so that no one can go from you to us and no one can come from us to you. There's a gulf that is fixed. When you're in hell, it's too late. The opportunity for salvation is the time. The opportunity for you to trust the Lord Jesus Christ is now. The opportunity for you to repent of your sins like that man we were thinking about earlier on with the children as he just bowed his head before God and he said, God be merciful to be a sinner. That opportunity is, is for now. When death comes, that opportunity goes. We have a major choice. <clears throat> it's a choice that has eternal consequences. It will last forever. 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 So hell is a place of torment. A place of memory. You know, when people say when you die, you don't take it in way, that's true. And I've said that already this afternoon. All your money, your wealth, your homes, your car, you leave it all behind. One thing you won't carry on and leave behind a memory. Even that man was spoken to, he said, Remember, remember your lifetime. And there was no doubt as vivid in that man's memory as if the very day it happened, as he would remember every day of his life. A memory. And you, a memory that you will take into eternity. A lost eternity will remember. What will you remember? <coughs> you might remember an event like this this afternoon. <coughs> you might remember sitting in a wee hall in Park Road off your leg. You might remember a man opening the Bible and reading verses that warned about that place. You'll remember it. You'll remember that he did nothing about it. You remember that you gambled with your soul. You remember that your soul's lost this lost forever. But I know it's more this afternoon. I'm not trying to frighten people into becoming Christians. I'm not here this afternoon to try and coerce people. I'm just trying to bring you and be faithful to the word of God that there's a great eternity. There is a great eternity. And there's preparation needs to be made for that eternity. It's a preparation that involves your soul. You'll never die in soul. It's a soul that will live on. That will live on either in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ because you've trusted him as your saviour. Because you've acknowledged your sin. Because you've accepted that you were guilty. And you deserve his punishment. That Christ Jesus came to take your punishment. And he's your saviour. And you're in heaven with him. Or you reject all of that. You reject him as your saviour and you reject the fact that you're a sinner and you reject the need of a saviour and you gamble with your soul and it's lost. It's lost forever. The Lord Jesus says, and somewhere else in scripture it says, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What is a profit a man? If he gains the whole world. And that's unachievable, isn't it, really? The whole world, bigger than wealth in our world. Imagine you could achieve it all. You lost your soul. What benefit is it? And there are ultra rich people in this world today. The wealth that they've got could feed countries, let alone individuals, and they'll die. And if they've never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, they'll perish forever. 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 It's solemn this afternoon. And yeah, I know the word of God is a good and it's a word that guides us. It's a word that challenges us. It's a word that tells us the truth. We can't pick and choose the parts of the Bible we like. We can't pick and choose the parts of the Bible that make us feel good and leave out the bits that, that make us feel a bit on edge. It's all God's word. We need to be faithful. It's a wonder this afternoon. Are you prepared for eternity? Are you ready? 
you ready for what lies beyond day. <clears throat> Never mind preparing your meal plan for the week or your annual leave requests for the year or whatever other events you might be planning. Prioritize this this afternoon. Prioritize it early. Prioritize your soul. I never die so children. Father, we come before you this afternoon. We just pray that you would just allow what's been said to have been said in a, in a heart of compassion for our life. We just think of the possibility, Father, that there are individuals who may have listened to people. And individuals who are sad in one day and find themselves on the wrong side of the family. So we just pray for them today, Father. Pray that there may have been nothing coercive. Pray that there may have been nothing, Father, that there may have been to do your work for you, trying to be the Spirit of God. That's your work and your work alone. And so I just pray that all that has been said to you, then you just leave it lined in the hearts and minds of people that are listening. All that has just been of the flesh, then just remove that from them. We pray and leave them with that alone to the soul. We trust that you would just speak into their hearts. We pray. Help us to be wise this afternoon. Help us all be wise in our preparations. We prepare for the journey. Prepare, prepare for the reality that there is somebody one day. There's eternity, and so we just pray that each of us may be ready for that. Yes. So we bless you for your work. We thank you for it. We thank you for the just everything that it contains. That which we like to hear, that which we like to read, and that which maybe we don't want to hear, don't like to read. But we just thank you for it all. And always it's your sure inspired work. We pray that you would use it for your glory each of our lives. We pray. This afternoon. This time of year, we bless you for who provided as well, the laws that come from you. That's what you bless it to us this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah.